you may, if you live in uh, Westchester, Rockland, Putnam, or Orange, recognize me from my long tenure at News 12. Uh, but as of today, oh, hey, go ahead, thank you. Uh, but as of today, yeah, thank you, Larry. As of today, I have a new role. Uh, I've started a new job today. I am now the special advisor to Governor Andrew Cuomo for the Tappan Zee Bridge. And in that role, my job is to help get all of you uh, information on this huge and historic project. Uh, one of the things we are going to try to do tonight is present some new information uh, as it relates to the process, because this is a very, very long process. But I'm honored the governor personally called me and asked me to join the team uh, and we are going to do everything in our power to keep everyone in the region informed about the process, make sure it is open, make sure it is transparent, share information, answer questions, listen to you, listen to all your concerns and get you the answers as we can. It is a process, it takes time, we don't have all the answers just yet, but we are working our way there. Uh, I want to acknowledge tonight uh, some of our partners in government, elected officials who are here. We appreciate you all being here. We'll be, we will hear uh, from those folks who want to speak a little later after we do a presentation that will give you an update on the new New York Bridge, the Tappan Zee Replacement Project. Uh, we will take questions from the audience as well. And we have with us uh, folks who know a lot more than I do. This is my first day on the job, uh, so I don't have all the answers, but these folks do. And I want to introduce them to you now. Then we are going to run through uh, a presentation that will get you up to speed on the latest information on the Tappan Zee Bridge. Then we will uh, take questions. So uh, you'll be hearing tonight from uh, Tom Madison. He's the executive director of the New York State Thruway Authority and the New York Canal Corporation and a former commissioner of the New York State Department of Transportation and a federal highway administration administrator at the U.S. Department of Transportation. He knows this stuff inside and out from both the state and federal level. Uh, also with us is uh, Mark Roach, a principal at Arup Engineering and a project manager for major projects. He's worked on complex bridge, rail, and highway projects around the world. He has an awful lot of answers for us. Uh, also, we welcome tonight Robert Conway. He's a senior vice president at AKRF Environmental Planning and Engineering Consultants. He's a nationally known engineering expert in the assessment of air quality impacts on transportation projects like the new Tappan Zee Bridge. Uh, also with us is Larry Schwartz. Larry Schwartz is the secretary to Governor Andrew Cuomo and a former deputy county executive here in Westchester County. A lot of you folks probably recognize Larry. He has been charged by the governor to make this bridge happen and he's doing everything in his power uh, to get that done. Uh, also with us is Karen Ray. She is the Deputy Secretary to the Governor for Transportation here in New York. She also served as a top aide to the U.S. Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood in Washington and was a key part of President Obama's high-speed rail initiative. She knows this project inside and out as well. Uh, we also have with us Amy Vargas, who is right down here, I believe, as well. Uh, she has collected all the questions. Many of you may have filled out questionnaires uh, and, and posted questions on those cards on the way in. Amy is organizing that for us. We will get to as many of your questions as we can tonight, uh, though we have limited time. We want to get people home as well. If we don't get to your question tonight, I want to emphasize uh, that we will respond to each and every one of those written questions in the next 24 to 48 hours. If you put your contact information on there, we will uh, communicate with you. And I want to also mention Dave Padgett is here down at the end. Uh, Dave is the environmental counsel from the firm of Sive, Padgett, and Rizel. He knows the ins and outs of this project as well. So we are going to hear from all of those folks, uh, but I want to give you a, a little bit of, of history and a little bit of overview as to how we got where we are. Uh, and if you'll take a look at the screen, uh, if you drive on the Tappan Zee Bridge, you already know a lot of this. It's outdated and overcrowded. Uh, more than 138,000 vehicles, cars, trucks, buses, cross that bridge every day. That is far more than it was designed uh, to handle. Traffic jams and delays are a regular occurrence. If anybody gets so much as a flat tire, 
uh, everything just screeches to a halt. The accident rate on the Tappan Zee Bridge right now is double the average accident rate for the rest of the entire New York State Thruway. The lanes are tight, there are no shoulders, it is a, a pinch point that has become a, a trouble spot for local commuters. Uh, no lanes, the emergency vehicles can't get through. If there's a disabled vehicle, it creates more and more delays. Now, we've been keeping the Tappan Zee Bridge up and running. Uh, it is not in danger of falling in the river, the experts assure me of that, but it is unsafe in that it has so many accidents and has so little capacity for the emergency crews to get through. Already, uh, spent on bridge maintenance over the past decade, $750 million. The expected cost over the next 20 years for maintenance and structural rehabilitation of the existing bridge is as high as three to four billion dollars. That is to keep it up, keep it running, get it up to seismic standards because right now it is not up to snuff when it comes to some of those ratings. Uh, we've been talking about this for a very long time at News 12 in my old capacity at News 12 Westchester we held a town meeting uh, about six weeks ago on this 500 people turned out in Terrytown to ask questions and get information on the Tappan Zee Bridge well we did the same thing about 11 years ago at a park in Irvington I don't know if anybody remembers that but we talked about the future of the Tappan Zee Bridge more than a decade ago. In fact, Governor George Pataki announced plans to build a new bridge back in 1999. And here's a quote from him from WCBS Radio. We are looking at the possibility of completely replacing the Tappan Zee because it is so old and does need such major repair. Uh, ten years later, now more than a decade, 430 public meetings have been held by the state. 150 concepts have been discussed. $88 million has been spent on studies, designs, and discussions, but nothing has been accomplished. We still have the same old dysfunctional bridge. Well, Governor Andrew Cuomo took control and finally ended that dysfunction. There is now an accelerated, comprehensive, and thorough review process that actually incorporates all the past studies as well. So that $88 million was not completely wasted. All the studies that have been done have carried over into the new project, although uh, the scope of the project has changed, and we'll get into some of that uh, as we move along here. There was also a new law passed just last December up in Albany and signed by the governor. Uh, it's called a design-build law, and you will hear more about that, but basically what it does is it allows uh, teams of experts to both design and build a new span, and you'll hear why that is so important uh, in just a little while. Uh, we've assembled a team of national experts to take a look at this, and in, in fact, international experts, people who have built uh, bridges and huge transportation projects here in New York, around the country, and around the world. And this new bridge will be built to last, at a minimum, 100 years. Uh, so we're gonna talk about options for how to proceed, but I wanna get you to the people who know more than I do. Again, it's still my first day on the job, so I'm learning. Uh, but let's start with Tom Madison from the New York State Thruway Authority. Thank you, Brian. Good evening, everybody. So when Governor Cuomo came into office and really took control of the project and articulated his vision for what he thought the Tappan Zee Bridge uh, replacement project should look like, it became clear that there were three distinct options that emerged for consideration. And the first option, of course, is to keep the existing structure in place. Now, to do that, we would be required at the Thruway Authority to spend approximately $1 billion over the next decade keeping the bridge just in a state of good repair that it is in today, keep it uh, up, up to uh, code, keep the deck in good shape, but we still wouldn't have the additional facilities and amenities of a new bridge. If we look out over the uh, horizon line about 20 years, we would need to invest anywhere between three and four billion dollars in the existing structure, and we still would not have any appreciable safety improvements, we wouldn't reduce congestion, we would not have that additional transit capacity that is so important. Option two is to build a new bridge, but also at the same time incorporate a new county uh, bus rapid transit system. And in order to do that, uh, after analyzing the costs associated with building a new structure, and then also looking at the costs associated with countywide transit and BRT, we'd be looking at probably doubling the 
cost of the, the bridge project, uh, we would be looking at years more in delay as, as studies for the appropriate alignments and, and other uh, analyses needed to take place, including additional environmental reviews. And so finally, option three, which we believed and arrived at as uh, the smartest option, is to build a new $5 billion bridge, a state-of-the-art, transit-ready bridge on a fast track and an accelerated pace that will provide us with all of the amenities that are lacking in the existing structure. Eight general traffic lanes, additional shoulders, which the bridge doesn't have today, and as Brian mentioned, is really the, the choke point or the pinch point for a lot of either accidents or simple delays, like running out of gas on the bridge can cause a tremendous amount of uh, problems. Uh, the new bridge will give us a dedicated bus lane and, and an enhanced uh, express bus service, if you will. The new bridge will also have a, a pedestrian walkway, and it, which will be shared with a bicycle lane. And we will also be managing traffic differently on the new structure. So we'll have the latest uh, engineering and design capabilities. We'll have sensors on the structure to help uh, monitor traffic and weather conditions in real time on the bridge and keep traffic moving. That includes changing the way the uh, easy pass lanes work and the toll booth structure works. Building a new bridge is going to give us all the things that I just mentioned, but it's also going to reduce congestion significantly. It will be safer for our, uh, our traveling public, and we're going to have better, faster uh, service for bus commuters, as was mentioned. This is really important. The structure when we build it, and you'll hear more about this in a moment, the new bridge is required to be ready for transit on the day that it opens. And that means any kind of transit option, from bus rapid transit to a heavy rail configuration. And of course, uh, on the day it opens, we will have an enhanced uh, express bus lane. All this and the added benefit of creating or sustaining 45,000 good jobs for uh, the Hudson Valley. So with that, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, bus rapid transit. Yeah, let's move on to Mark Roach of Arab Engineering. This guy knows everything about <laughs> bus rapid transit. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm an engineer, um, and I've had the opportunity over the last 10 years uh, leading a team of engineers, uh, up to about 100 people at times, and working with the DOT and the Thruway to really look at what it would take to put BRT in the corridor which exists for, well, from Suffern to Portchester. And I'm here really to tell you what we've learned about that. And the real thing I want to give you a feel for is, is to justify the message, to justify the idea that it's, it's an expensive system, it's more expensive than other systems around the country, and there's a reason for that, and I'll tell you that in a minute. But if I could just tell you a little bit about what the characteristics of bus rapid transit are. And if you think of bus rapid transit as a train with rubber tires, that's really what it is. And if you think of what the characteristics of a train are and your reliability on train service, you know that a train is going to arrive somewhere at a certain time, it will deliver you somewhere at an exact time, and you have confidence in that. What bus rapid transit is, is the same as the train type of characteristic, where you should be able to rely on that bus to arrive at a certain place and deliver you at a certain place at the right time. And if you think about that, if you're a father or a mother, you've gone to work, you've used the BRT service, if something happens to your son or daughter and there's an emergency, you want to know that you don't need your car, that you can rely on the BRT service to go and be there at the right time, deliver you home to take care of your family if you need it. And if you can't rely on that, you won't use the service. And that's what the service of BRT is. That's, it's, a, it's a system. We use the word bus rapid transit, it really should be called bus reliable transit. If you don't trust it, it won't work. That's the characteristic of the system. I've been part of a team that's gone through the 30 miles from Suffern to Portchester, piece by piece by piece, to understand exactly what it takes to put BRT in the corridor. And with those 100 engineers, we have looked at how can we put a space to fit the transit. And to make that a reliable transit system, we can't say to you that it, we can't let happen if there is a traffic jam and the bus stops 
and you can't get home to your son or daughter, you're never going to use that system again. To give you the reliability that you can use that system, we have to put the bus in dedicated lanes. If it doesn't go in dedicated lanes, tomorrow you won't trust the system because it's stopped with traffic, I'll take my car tomorrow. So we've looked to see how can we go across the 30 miles of corridor and provide the lanes necessary to fit the BRT system in. And it's a very congested corridor, it's an urban corridor, there are buildings and families and homes and cemeteries all the way along the corridor. There's big cuts, there's big uh, rock cuts, there's all sorts of steep hills that we all have, there's lots of constraints to work with. And that makes the system a little more expensive than others. This is just a little map of what the system could be from Worcester to uh, Suffern. And the idea being that you should be able to get on a bus on, from your home in one of those lines that goes north or south. That bus should be able to take you through the corridor, get directly onto these dedicated lanes on this 30 miles. You can get off at a number of stations along that line if you would like transfer to another bus, which would take you directly to the door of where you want to go, all in a reliable way as bus reliable transport, all in dedicated lanes. So where would we put those dedicated lanes? They don't exist out there right now. If they did exist out there in that 30 miles right now, bus rapid transit would be a very economical system. But we don't have those dedicated lanes. So what we've looked at across the 30 miles is where could we put those dedicated lanes? And on the left-hand side there, you'll see a, a photograph of buses down the center of a highway, not, not in New York. But what makes the BRT expensive is that to fit those dedicated lanes down the middle, we have to take the existing highway and shift it out. We have to create a gap down the middle of 30 or 40 feet. And the sheer cost of doing that is very expensive. The idea that you have to change all the bridges that go over, all the bridges that go under, all the connecting roads, all the interchanges. Imagine what would happen with the stations for the BRT down the middle. You have to widen around the stations. You have to put in special places for bus to get in. It's a very expensive thing to make the infrastructure to provide those dedicated lanes. Now, if you look at the second and third numbers there, I think for the BRT cost in Rockland of 0.4 billion, that's the type of number that people expect BRT to cost. And if you look at all the systems that have happened where dedicated lanes are available to be used, that's the sort of number for BRT in many places around the country. But here, because we don't have those dedicated lanes, there's an initial cost up front of providing those lanes. And that's what makes BRT expensive in this particular corridor. On the right-hand side, we've looked at another way of doing this. Could we put the BRT on the side instead of down the center? Does that make it a more economical system? Are there less constraints if we don't move the highway? Again, what we found is that there are tremendous constraints as you, co as you come across, particularly Rockland, for example. There's a number of places, for example, at Interchange 11, where there's a big rock cut in through the hill. And if you put BRT down the side, you actually have to take away almost all of that mountain. As you come down towards the bridge, you recognize you're coming through the Palisades. If you put the BRT new lanes on the north side, you're going through home, so you wouldn't. If you put it on the south side, you have to cut into the Palisades hill. It's an extremely complex and energetic thing to hold that mountain up for, for, from an engineering point of view, and that's a costly element. What we found is whether we put it in the center or on the side, the BRT is a very expensive thing to do in this 30 miles. We looked at a shorter version of the BRT. Would it make some sort of sense to, say, go for, from a system that starts in Palisades Mall to Tarrytown Station? And really, this was just looking at the data that we had to say, would, would this be uh, an economical way of going forward? Would this be a practical way of going forward? Well, can't quite answer the practical way, because would you use it is a big question that we would have. But just this section here, because of all the major constraints in the Palisades, Interchange 11, Interchange 10, having to redo all the infrastructure associated with that, it becomes a very expensive component even just to do this short five or six mile section. Because you have to hold up the Palisades, you have to redo interchanges, you have to provide those dedicated lanes for which they just don't exist out there right now. So the message that I want to leave you is from the work that we've done, looking at the BRT, to make it work in this corridor, we have to build almost a new highway completely along the whole 30 miles to make it fit. And that's the part that makes BRT expensive. And if you were to sort of look at that, what would it cost you? I mean, an equivalent toll to finance that, that could be up to $30 per trip across the bridge. 
And that's a major cost. And I think that's really what I've got. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're going to move on to Robert Conway from AKRF Consultants. Uh, he is going to talk about the final environmental impact statement. This is actually a document that is going to come out next week, but this is a little bit of a preview of some of the things uh, that we'll hear about in that. Thank you, Brian. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to uh, explain to everyone what, a, what an uh, environmental impact statement is. It, the one thing it, it isn't, it isn't a document that's pre prepared in a vacuum by the state, by us, or uh, the Thruway Authority near a state DOT. It's actually, the document is the Federal Highway Administration's document. And in that, uh, there are also a number of cooperating agencies that are worked with it, experts in their particular realm, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard, say, for navigation, the Army Corps of Engineers for dredging, the National Marine Fisheries for Endangered Species, the Advisory Council. These are for historic preservation. These are the federal agencies that are cooperating. There are also the state agencies, such as the New York State DEC and uh, the New York State Historic Preservation Office and the Department of State, in addition to the team of consultants and engineers who have been working on this project. Essentially, it becomes peer-reviewed. The process is the engineers prepare the, the, the engineering analysis. We do an environmental analysis, estimate construction effects, and then it gets reviewed by these agencies and these cooperating agencies in terms of their in terms of their expertise before it was published. It was published, the draft EIS was published in January. We had our hearings and now the FEIS is soon to be published. Uh, the, the, the public hearings were tremendously attended. Over a thousand people showed up. I think it was the largest I've ever seen and I've been involved in projects like Second Avenue Subway, East Side Access, the World Trade Center projects and this had the most people attend the hearings, to two hearings that I've seen. Over 3,000 comments were received, and they are going to be responded to in this FEIS, so you'll see an enormous new volume in the FEIS that will be responding to the comments. We've extended the comment period from 45 to 60 days. Uh, 60 days is, is a typical uh, comment period for, for a major project. That was done on those projects I just mentioned, Eastside Access, the Trade Center, Permanent Path, the New Path Terminal. All those are under 60 days. 60 days are under for their comment periods. And as Brian said, next week uh, they'll be publishing the FEIS. Uh, in terms of the comments we received, first, in terms of support, what comments we received in terms of support of the project, obviously building a better, new, safer bridge that improved traffic operations. It was very important in terms of reducing congestion, <coughs> reducing time during delays due to accidents or incidences. Uh, that we would have a better bridge and a better emergency access, obviously creating jobs and moving forward with the infrastructure in this country, preparing, uh, putting a lot of people to work doing that. And importantly is that when we do do the new bridge, it's going to be transit ready. And I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, how we're doing that in terms of uh, the capabilities of that bridge in the future. Comments requested. Now, in, in comments requested additional information or people had concerns about, while there were, said 3,000 comments, there were probably 50, 60 themes throughout. The three of the biggest themes that we saw throughout and, and 100, there could be out of 3,000 comments, maybe 100 comments just on each one of these. Uh, community impacts during construction, that's generally the upland communities on the Rockland and Westchester County, the residential neighborhoods, what happens during construction in terms of air quality, traffic, noise, vibration. Uh, another major area was obviously the transit capability. Uh, when will be, why aren't we doing BRT or commuter rapid transit? When will you do it? How can you do it? And finally, another set of comments is the impacts of the construction of the bridge itself and basically the piers and the foundations and the dredging work on the river, on the Hudson River environment and ecology. Okay, so in terms of uh, impacts during construction, as I said, there are many concerns from residences uh, about noise, vibration, dust, air quality, and traffic, particularly uh, traffic, uh, heavy duty vehicles, uh, delivery, and removal material. Um, what do we do? And a lot of things we've learned and a lot of what we call in, in the EIS, we call them environmental performance commitments. We've learned this through major projects in urban areas, as I said. Uh, this was initially developed as part of the World Trade Center redevelopment, which had about $20 billion worth of development a square mile, which had up to 2,000 trucks a day come. There was a series of uh, commitments by the federal and state agencies working on these projects to develop these environmental performance uh, commitments. And we've actually worked on those and implemented even 
even more stringent ones and, 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 and compound it in terms of what we'd like to do. So first, for extensive, uh, for example, to how to reduce noise, impacts of noise. I mean, some of it is unavoidable during construction, a major infrastructure construction project, heavy civil engineering. There, there, it's hard to avoid that. But what we have done is first, there are timing restrictions. There are restrictions on the most noise intrusive uh, methods such as, by, such as the uh, impact of pile driving. So they'll be restricted at certain times during the day. There'll be restrictions on other work during uh, weekends and at nights can only be light basically equipment. No heavy, no heavy work can be done that would produce noise levels over a very, a very uh, restrictive low level. Um, find the next step of mitigation measures, then you can, we have applied measures to reduce the noise at the source itself, which is to use quiet equipment, to use mufflers, shrouds around the equipment, to use electric equipment where it's available, such that the noise levels from the equipment itself have been reduced in the design build, in the design build contract documents. There is a list of equipment and a list of a noise emission standards that they have to meet. In addition to that, we're asking that in certain cases where we know there'll be truck access routes off the thruway or there's work platforms on the river, we'll be putting uh, temporary enclosures or noise barriers between that and the homes to also help reduce the noise level. So it's a, a three-part program there. Finally, there's a noise and vibration monitoring program that will be done on both sides of the river during this to make sure that the contractors are meeting their requirements in terms of the emission standards. Uh, that's generally how we're looking at noise. In terms of air quality, I, think that this is probably uh, the most stringent set of air quality emission controls related to particulates and nitrogen oxides on any major project probably in the country at this point. Uh, as the projects that I've talked about, I worked in New York City in urban environment, they were re requesting that contractors use tier two equipment, which is relatively new equipment in the middle, the middle 2005, six, seven, eight. And we've gone further and said, we're gonna now ask the contracts and told them that they're gonna be using tier three equipment with this diesel particulate filters to get the ultimate in reduction technologies that we can to reduce pollutants during construction. So that's one of the things that we've also pushed the envelope on the contractors to say that we want to do. Uh, one of the things we're also, uh, it's almost the, the location of the project makes the impacts for a $5 billion project from a truck traffic pretty uh, much lower than you would expect for a major urban project. Why? Much of the material is going to be delivered by barges. Two, uh, a lot of the material will come right off the throughway, right off the ramps on, uh, from the throughway, right down to the river work platforms, avoiding local roads. So there's a lot of opportunities there for reducing that kind of impact that would typically would occur in a, uh, in a, in a $5 billion construction project. What we heard about transit is transit has to be part of the consideration of this bridge. Uh, in many different um, ways, people have said that comment. And what we are doing, one, we're allowing for a dedicated lane for express bus service from the day the bridge opens. But even more importantly, we're investing in the future. We're maximizing, to maximize the public investment in this project, we're asking, we're actually requesting the design build teams to make sure that their structure will be able to handle bus or even rail rapid transit, you know, commuter heavy rail. So the foundations and the structure itself will have to be able to accommodate that so that when the future planning occurs and a system is developed uh, on, throughout both counties, the bridge will be able to handle that. On the river environment, obviously, we've had uh, comments that's a large three-mile crossing, a lot of piers, a lot of work in the river, um, a lot of concern about the ecology of the river, habitats, this particularly endangered species, the endangered Atlantic and short-nosed sturgeon. And from that, the two major concerns of what have been the impacts to the dredging required for the project and what is the uh, effects of the foundations that we're putting in, particularly the uh, copper dams and, and, and pile driving. Well, for each of these, we've worked with our cooperating state and federal agencies to develop a, a very stringent and strong one uh, set of environmental performance commitments to be used during the construction and also a compensatory mitigation program that will also be done after the project construction to provide a net benefit to the environment. Uh, for dredging, one of the things we're doing, we're not only using the uh, equipment itself that is there to reduce any effects or dispersion of sediments, we'll be reducing it to a three months annual. That's all we'll be able to do in the, to protect the migratory fish patterns. In addition, 
we, on all dredging operations. During all dredging operations, there will be wildlife biologists certified by NIMS, uh, National Marine Fisheries, to make sure that uh, we are protecting the endangered species during this process and if they inadvertently get caught in any machinery. Uh, for pile driving, the, uh, obviously the bridge of this size requires a lot of piles because of the type of soil that we have out there in the sediment. But there's a lot of concern. It was, there was a lot of concern. We've done a, a comprehensive study and worked with the National Marine Fisheries and New York State DEC. You might have known that there was a pile demonstration project in the spring that we looked at various measures to attenuate noise. One of the things we found out was that our estimates in the, the DEIS, the Draft Environmental Impact Statement, overestimated our effect on the fish. We were quite conservative. <coughs> We found out that the noise impacts or in the, from with the attenuation measures, we can reduce them better. They did not go as far as we thought they would. Uh, the National Marine Fisheries agreed, and uh, in their biological p uh, opinion, which is required on the Endangered Species Act, declared that building of the bridge will not uh, jeopardize the uh, endangered species, the continued existence of the Atlantic sturgeon and the uh, short nose sturgeon. So now, Thank you, Robert. Let's move on to uh, Larry Schwartz, Secretary to the Governor. He will finish off uh, the presentation, and then we'll get to some of your questions. Thank you, Brian. Um, before I get started, let me just say that, um, you know, Governor Cuomo, more importantly than Go Governor Cuomo asking me to take the lead um, after the legislati legislative session ended in June this year to get, take the point, take the lead, to move the bridge project forward. Uh, is that I'm a Westchester County resident. I live in the city of White Plains. I've been there since 1997. I served 11 years under then County Executive Andy Spano and look forward to working closely with now County Executive Astorino. And more importantly, besides myself, um, when the governor asked Brian Connie Bear to come in to work with me to be the day-to-day -day boots on the ground guy working with the, our elected officials and our business community and our uh, civic groups and our homeowners associations. Brian is a Westchester County resident. Amy Vargas, who is a regional rep for ESDC that's also a member of the project team. She lives in Rockland County. So the leaders of the project team, and it's gonna grow and expand. We are Westchester and Rockland County residents. It's not people from out of state or out, outside the lower Hudson Valley region that's gonna be here full time to educate, to communicate, to work with the residents and the people of Westchester and Rockland County, and to create the most open and transparent process possible, but also to listen to your concerns. I was on News 12 a number of weeks ago when Brian was actually still working over there, uh, representing uh, the governor in the state of New York, and I made it clear during that two-hour town hall meeting that I would meet with a number of impacted homeowners as well as a number of the homeowners groups uh, that live uh, next to the bridge on both sides of the river, and I did meet with those homeowners and those homeowners groups already, and we've set up a whole series of community meetings. We've done two today, including this one tonight. We have two tomorrow in Rockland County, and we're looking to schedule between 50 and 100, and if necessary, more um, meetings to talk with everybody and anybody that we need to listen to, understand what your concerns are, and try to address them um, as, as best as possible, and I give you my word uh, on behalf of the governor that when we make a commitment going forward, that commitment will be solid. We will commit that, keep that commitment, and that commitment won't change. So let me talk a little bit more about the process, because I think that's as important as anything. Um, the old process when it came to constructing public works projects, including bridges, uh, was kind of, a, crazy um, and wasteful. Uh, the way it would work is that you would first, when you wanted to build a bridge or a road or any other kind of major public works project, you would put out um, an RFP or you do a bid to hire someone to design the project. And when that project was completed and you had 100% design, you would then take that design and you'd do a new bidding process to hire a contractor that to build what someone else designed. And I um, have to tell you that through the history of public works projects, more times than not, um, that hurt the taxpayers of this state. Projects were delayed, unexpected things came up, 
the contractor was not liable and responsible for the design that was done by somebody else. It resulted in what was called change orders. The bottom line is most projects were delayed, they fell behind schedule, they ran over budget, and the people that paid for it were you, the people of New York State, the taxpayers of the state. The 287 corridor is probably one of the best examples, and for someone that drives 287 all the time and has to get off at exit 8E to get home in White Plains, uh, I have suffered like most of you, if not all of you, over the last decade through all the traffic construction work that's gone on in 287. Unfortunately, because of the old way that we design and bid it out projects, 287 is, a, is a, uh, a bad symbol of what goes wrong, and that project fell years behind schedule and literally cost like $60 million more than was originally budgeted. And again, when you have to go out and borrow more money and spend it, and you have to pay it back, it's the taxpayers that are paying that back. The liability and burden was not on the contractor under the old system. Um, the, the liability fell on state government and ultimately the taxpayers of the state. Um, whoops, I hit the red button instead of the green button. Um, in 2011, the, the governor clearly knew that the old process uh, was not in the best interest of the taxpayer. It made no sense. It was the old way of doing things. Um, it was silly. It was ridiculous. So he introduced uh, legislation in 2011, and I want to thank our state legislators. A number of them were here tonight, both in the Senate and the Assembly, because working with Governor Cuomo, we were able to pass design-build legislation um, in 2011. And not only is, is this design-build uh, process going to be used for the new Tappan Zee Bridge, but it's going to be used in every uh, New York State public works project going forward. In essence, now we have four international teams that are bidding uh, on the Tappan Zee Bridge. And I, when I say international, the teams that each bidder has put together, they are world-renowned uh, companies that have built bridges all over the globe. Uh, but they are now responsible for not only designing it, but when they bid on it, they will also be responsible for building it. Um, and what this means is that the risk and the cost of the bridge uh, going forward will be uh, on the back of the, bid, the winning bidder and not on the taxpayers of New York State. So not only are we uh, unleashing creativity and innovation through these four design teams, um, but whoever is the ultimate winner, they will be liable uh, to get this bridge built on time, and if there's any additional costs, they, uh, except if it's uh, you know, something that Mother Nature created, they will be responsible for any delays and cost overruns if there are any. We are very uh, excited and we're optimistic because the fact that we have four bidders uh, that are bidding, that means we think we're gonna get a really good price and we think that the designs that will come in here will be uh, extremely imaginative and creative, um, both aesthetically and clearly from an engineering uh, perspective. And so I've gone through this. Um, one of the other things that we're going to do, again, this is going to be part of our, our public outreach process, is uh, when these bids come in, and they're, they're coming in uh, this Friday, July 27th, we will set up a public process to uh, let uh, the residents of New York State, especially uh, Westchester and Rockland, whether there are elected officials, um, both state and local and federal, but also the residents of uh, those two counties uh, as well, is to keep you informed throughout the entire process. So we're working on something right now on how we can make the entire process of review and decision making uh, public so you can be, be informed and aware of what's going on. And on some level, 
getting your participation and input. And one of the things the governor is going to do is when these bids come in, a number of you know, uh, technical teams of some of the best and brightest engineers and architect and designers are going to be assembled to look at whether or not uh, the engineering and design aspects of, uh, that have been proposed by the bidders, whether or not it's going to work and whether or not it's feasible. Through this process, we're going to create a selection uh, blue ribbon panel made up of the best and brightest bridge builders, engineers, designers, but we're also going to have representatives of, the, of County Executive Vanderhoff's office, County Executive Astorino's office. We are going to invite other members of uh, government as well as uh, some representatives of other stakeholders to be part of the selection process in the Blue Ribbon Panel. So we're working on that uh, now, and hopefully we'll announce that uh, uh, in the near future. Last, I want to say that as we go forward, um, we have, and we're in the process of creating um, a on the ground, as I mentioned before, a project team. In the slide, we call it the New New York Bridge Community Action Team. Call it whatever you want. We're the, here, we're, the, we're here team. We're here to work with you. We're here to partner with you. We're here to listen to you. Um, I've spent a lot of time already in the last two to three weeks not talking but listening and learning and understanding uh, what people's concerns are, what they've heard at prior public meetings, what they've heard from DOT, state DOT, or the New York State Thruway Authority. And I promised them I would go and do my due diligence and go back and make the best possible recommendations and give the governor the best possible advice so we can come back to you with sound and solid commitments and decisions. So one of the things that we plan on doing is opening an office here. Um, I believe we're going to be able to open up an office here in Tarrytown, right next to the bridge. It will be staffed with Brian, Amy. I will be present, uh, not on a full-time basis, but on a part-time basis, and we'll have other members of the administration as well as the Thruway Authority and, and our consultants all uh, working out of that office. Uh, meeting with you there or coming out and meeting with you um, in your respective community to do briefings, update, to be proactive, to answer questions and any concerns that you may have. The last thing I just want to mention uh, before um, we open it up to some statements and some questions is uh, starting today uh, we uh, created a toll-free phone number. You can see it there uh, on the screen, as well as a new website. That uh, phone will be manned by a live person if for some reason it's not being staffed because the calls come in at night or over the weekend. My commitment to you is that we will answer uh, your call and answer the questions behind that call or if you leave a message within 24 to 48 hours. Um, and you have my word on that. And if you, if you can't or you're not comfortable making the call, then feel free to log on to the website. Uh, there's plenty of information on the website. It will be constantly updated with information. So feel free to go on it on a regular basis to learn more about the process and what's going on in the governor's plan, but also to submit questions and raise concerns. And we will be reviewing the website on a daily basis and answering your questions or concerns in the same time frame as if you make a call to the toll-free number. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Larry. Uh, so that is basically the presentation. We wanted to get all that information to you, and please go to that website. Literally 10 years uh, of studies and documentation are there. It can be a little overwhelming, uh, but you can search it. You can explore around. It is really a wonderful tool uh, that anyone can use. We want to hear from you tonight. That's really the reason we're here, is to get some feedback. So I'm going to ask, uh, I've been given these cards with people's names who have specific questions. When I call your name, if you go to one of these two microphones uh, and ask your question, then I will kind of direct it to who may be the best to answer it. Uh, we're going to start with James Bernardo of Somers. Mr. Bernardo, are you here? There he is. Come on down, as they say. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I see that you have this, this phone number, 
and, and having these meetings are great. The, the question though is, when I call this number, I'm not gonna get a person, is what you just said. I'm gonna have to leave a message. No, you will get a person. I mean, if you call at nine o'clock at night or you call on a, or someone calls on a Saturday or Sunday, you know, there may not be a person there then. So when the person, you know, during regular business hours, they'll be there to answer the phone. So it won't be staffed 24 seven, but it will be staffed at least five days a week, eight to 10 hours a day. But whether the person's there to answer the call or we get the message, we promise that, or I promise, I'll say, that we'll answer your question or, or address your concern within 24 to 48 hours. So the person may not be the one that could answer the question? It depends again on, on, the, on the particular question, that's right, and if they can't, then they certainly will find the right person that can give, give the answer and either get back on the phone with you or that person that you spoke to will give, get back to you with the answer. Okay, thank you. And if you're not satisfied, call us. <laughs> I mean that. Well, when you say call us, you mean you directly? You call me, call Brian Connie Bear, you ask us for our phone number, you can have it. Okay. Thank you. It's my first day on the job. I don't have a BlackBerry yet. But when I do, you'll all get it. He'll have it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I may actually have it tonight. We'll see. And tonight is still young. Uh, let's hear from Paul Ryan of Cortland. I believe Mr. Ryan has a question for us. Well, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to uh, speak tonight. Uh, my question, uh, let me phrase it this way. Uh, since Governor Cuomo has come on uh, as the governor and, and during the campaign, he's always been, I think, very conscious of the tax consequences that are, are burdens upon the residents of the state of New York. And my question is just simple. It, it, it concerns the funding. And uh, there's a lot of people that are interested in how we're going to fund this. So my question is simple. How are we going to pay for the bridge? Uh, Tom Madison, you want to take that one? Sure, I'd love to. Well, as we've said um, publicly and I think consistently, the, the primary funding mechanism of the new bridge will be toll back bonds from the Thruway Authority. And we're not prepared yet to disclose a full financial plan for a couple of key reasons. One is, uh, as was mentioned in the presentation, this Friday we will be getting bids, hopefully from all four of the world-class design build teams that have been working on developing proposals uh, for many months now. And so that variable, what their price is going to be, and by the way, we won't know this, we won't know the number yet on Friday, even though they're delivering the bids on Friday, but what the ultimate number is of the team that's selected to move forward with this project is a very important piece of information that we need to develop uh, the financing plan. The other piece that's still an open issue is that we will be pursuing federal funding for the project and specifically we'll be going after a long-term low interest loan uh, called a TIFIA loan uh, and we've requested uh, an amount in, in the range of $2 billion with some recent legal changes we may even be able to go beyond that $2 billion ask. So those two things will have a great impact on ultimately the cost of the structure and how it will be paid for. Uh, what we've also said consistently is that uh, tolls on the bridge will be consistent with other Hudson River crossings and that those deep commuter discounts and easy pass discounts that people are accustomed to will remain in place. So uh, we expect you know, in, in later on this year to be able to present the full a financial plan that gives you a very specific <coughs> indication of how the bridge will be financed. All right. Uh, how about Kirk Ortega of Mount Vernon? Mr. Ortega has a question for us. Hi, good evening. My question, I noticed that you um, have set out about 45,000 jobs that's going to be created from the Tappan Zee project. My question is, is uh, can you break that up into part-time jobs and full-time jobs? Um, moreover, uh, I represent the Latino Builders Council. I am a DBE contractor, so maybe you can also expand on the DBE program. I, I believe that the uh, goal set by the governor is applaudable, almost hist in fact historic. So maybe you can share with small business on, on some of those uh, things that small businesses are looking for. Uh, Tom, you want to do that one? Or sure. Karen, Tom? Uh, sure. Well, thank you for the question. and. Um, 
that 45,000, you know, I can't break it down for you right now into full and part-time. Uh, what I can tell you is that that number was derived from a formula for projects in this range, public infrastructure, specifically transportation projects that are in this size and in this level of complexity. How many jobs will be direct jobs to build the facility, but also to support the construction? And by support, I mean not, not just the specific construction jobs like fabrication or materials, but even those community jobs, the, you know, the pizza shop where people have lunch, uh, all of those things are factored into that equation. Uh, with respect to the disadvantaged business enterprises, uh, the, the contract documents that these four proposing teams that we've talked about uh, sets forth some very specific criteria for goals that uh, the, each of the teams would need to pursue. And their proposals will actually be rated in part on their plan for how they will deal with the DBE, M and WBE, and small business community. But we've estimated that there will be opportunities created for at least 4,000 uh, 4, workers in those categories. Uh, probably in the neighborhood of $400 million worth of work for DBEs, M and WBEs. And I appreciate the comment about Governor Cuomo's goal because it's, it's laudable and it's aggressive. And it's also, I think, realistic. And we worked very hard on the project team to set a goal that we believed was attainable and we're charging whoever ends up being the constructor on this project to vigorously pursue those goals and execute their plan. Tom, just for those who don't speak government, DBE. The, that's the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. Uh, and the M and WB is Minority and Women Owned Business. Thank you. Uh, Tony Ferrantello, uh, he is an architect from Terrytown. Mr. Ferrantello, are you here? Thank you. Uh, before the presentation, my question was what mechanism would be in place to control uh, cost overruns, and I think you explained it. It's a design build with a cost not to exceed at a risk uh, by the contractor, and that's a wonderful delivery method. Uh, my question really is now that having designed schools, and let's say there's a school with classroom trailers, and you design a school, and it's constructed after a year, and it's a 100,000 square foot school. At, the, the relationship is that after the school was designed and constructed, the trailer still remained. So my question is, are eight lanes sufficient and were enough demographic studies put in place that perhaps would yield the necessity for 12 lanes? Thank you. Uh, Karen Ray, what, could you want to tackle Mark, that one? Mm -hmm. Tom? 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 Wanted to do it? We're all looking at marks. Uh, <laughs> you're out. Um, I, I think the, the one thing that, that we've learned through many projects around the world is that you can't grow your traffic lanes out of congestion. Mm -hmm. No matter how many lanes you build, they will always get full. The, the answer to increasing or solving congestion or to increasing capacity is, is transit. And that, that's mainly why there's a major component of the bridge to allow during its 100, 150 year life for it to grow with whatever happens in the communities in Rockland and Westchester. And that transit should be a major part of that ability to grow. We just can't build our way with lanes out of congestion. And to emphasize the point, uh, about a month ago, uh, the governor and, and Larry Schwartz promised there will be dedicated bus lanes from day one when this bridge opens. Uh, on those very wide shoulders where there are emergency lanes, there will be dedicated bus lanes for things like the Tappan Zee Express to avoid any possible uh, traffic. So that is, is certainly one step in the right direction. Um, Carolyn Cunningham, come on down. Do you have a question for us? I believe you're from Rye, is that correct? Uh, yes, I am, and right, I'm welcome. speaking as a representative from Federated Conservationists of Westchester County. And a question out, because we recently supported a letter by the Rockland County ex um, head of their legislature, Harriet Cornell, writing to the governor, and we wrote our own letter to the governor, which I would be happy to hand to Mr. Schwartz, too, supporting her idea that knowing how much trouble it is to come up with this funding, 
but knowing how deeply committed we are to the mask transit and have been through all the 10 years of study, could we not get a commitment from the governor now that as soon as we get the money for the bridge and it is underway, that we have an equal commitment from the governor and the administration to work for the funding to get the mass transit on as soon as possible. Larry Schwartz, I think that's you. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, Carolyn. Nice to see you. It's been Good a long to time. See you. Uh, I believe the commitment that I can sit here and make tonight on behalf of the governor is a commitment that, Carolyn, we'll work with your organization as well as our uh, elected officials here. We're going to work closely with County Executives Vanderhoff and Astorino, our state and congressional delegation, our homeowners groups again, to look at going forward uh, what will work, what will um, be the right formula or mechanism when it comes to transit in Westchester and Rockland County in a way that is feasible, affordable, and will improve the quality of life not negatively impact the quality of life of our local towns and villages in both of those counties. So the governor is committed to transit. That's why when I came into News 12, I stated on his behalf that there will be a dedicated lane at a minimum during the rush hour. Hopefully it'll be uh, throughout the day. And we're committed to finding transit solutions both off the bridge in Rockland and Westchester County. But we have to do this working together in partnership including our local mayors, supervisors, our local electeds, our homeowners, our, our civic groups, our business community, and figure out what makes sense, whether it's feasible and affordable and it's not going to have a ne negative impact on our communities to widen 287. Uh, you probably remember, I know I do, back in 1997, there was uh, an effort to widen 287 and create HOV lanes. And there was tremendous opposition by many of our towns and villages in Westchester County along 287 who were opposed to that widening. And then Governor Pataki killed the plan. Um, so clearly, while well, times change uh, as years go by, we, need, we can't do this in a vacuum. And whether or not we try to build a dedicated lane or lanes on roads like 119, those are going to have significant impacts to those communities uh, which 119 runs through. So we cannot do it in a vacuum. We're going to do it openly in partnership with everyone and do it in a way that we believe, you know, our taxpayers can afford it and will not negatively impact the quality of life. We're already overburdened with taxes here. That's why the governor proposed and passed the property tax cap and isn't uh, proposing any tax increases in his first two budgets, nor will he do it in his next two budgets. In his first term of office. So we have to do things f that are financially smart and things that we can af do that people in this region can afford. Tom Madison, you want to add something? Yeah, I'd just like to add, you know, in addition to what Mr. Schwartz just explained as a commitment, a commitment for the future to work with the communities to understand what those transit options might be. Uh, it's important to note that when the governor set forth his vision, when he took control of this project and process, Part of that vision was to make a transit-ready bridge. Right. And part of making a bridge ready for transit is to make a significant incremental investment in that structure today, even though there's no adjoining uh, transit systems in Rockland or in Westchester counties right now. So that commitment is represented by hundreds of millions of dollars in investment in this structure today to make sure that it will be fortified, that the foundations are strong enough, that there's capacity, as we've talked about, on the, on the deck of the bridge, so that in the future, any type of transit, whether it's enhanced express bus service, which we know will be there the day the bridge opens, the potential for a bus rapid transit system, or even a heavy uh, commuter rail system like uh, Metro North Railroad, the bridge will be ready and prepared for transit the day that it opens, and that's a very significant commitment. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let's hear from some of our local elected officials. There are a lot of you in the audience. Uh, let's start with Assemblywoman Amy Pollan. Would you like to get up uh, and join us, ma'am?
Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to thank all of you for the presentation tonight. Um, it was um, very informative, and I believe that your presence here demonstrates your commitment to uh, the community and to an ongoing conversation. So it's very much appreciated. Um, I think that we all here know, you know, how important the Tappan Sea Bridge is to not only the Hudson region, but to the entire state. So, you know, we're invested uh, locally in ensuring that it goes well, um, but clearly um, there's a larger goal uh, in making sure that it's there for the duration of our lifetimes and our children's lifetimes. As Brian pointed out, you know, this has been a conversation for a very long time. It, I remember going to meetings way before I was elected, um, and of course, at that time, uh, there's always been a concern, and I've been a tremendous proponent of making sure that we include uh, mass transit in anything that we design. And listening here tonight, it's very, very clear that those goals are being incorporated by a dedicated bus lane, day one, and from having uh, the capacity for light rail, which has really been um, at the forefront of the concerns of most of the environmental community. So again, um, you know, it's clear that we're going in the right direction, and it's time, considering the federal money at stake, to go forward now. If we delay, we lose that, and it's going to bear um, a tremendous burden on all of the taxpayers in this state and in this region in particular, because we'll be dealing with the toll increases. So it's time to go forward uh, in order to maximize our ability to get the, that $2 billion. Um, and it's also very clear that the 30-mile infrastructure that we would need uh, in both Westchester and Rockland is extraordinarily expensive. So, uh, and not only expensive, uh, it's going to infringe on, um, you know, as it was pointed out um, by, by, the, um, by Larry, uh, Larry Schwartz a few minutes ago, um, you know, when the option was brought up many years ago, which I do remember, uh, there were a lot of community concerns. So we have to go slow uh, and make sure that all of the communities that would be impacted by those widenings in whatever way we go forward um, are included in a community conversation. And we do not have time to do that adequately now without risking that $2 billion. So I just wanted to make my points clear, and I really, again, want to thank you all for being here and for opening the dialogue and continuing that. Thank you. No, thank you for your comments and for your support. Uh, Assemblyman Robert Costelli is also with us. Uh, Mr. Costelli, would you like to say a few words? First, congratulations on your new job, Brian. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is an unusual capacity to find me and Larry. Usually you find me ambushing you in a hallway up in Albany looking for some constituent need or complaining about something else. But I think it's only fair to thank you and the governor for assembling this team and making it available to all of us. It is an outstanding team of experts. Many people here don't realize that you are all available to us behind the scenes as well as in a forum like this. You have not ducked any of these issues, and on a personal level, I really respect it, and I appreciate it. You mentioned before that there would be as many as 100 more of these meetings taking place. Can you give us some idea of how often they will take place? Um, they're going to take place as, as often as they need to. I mean, we had two today. We're having two tomorrow. I had a number of last week. With Brian now part of the team and here full time with other people, we've already started making calls and scheduling other meetings. Um, I'm, I plan with Brian reaching out to all the Rivertown mayors and setting up meetings with them. Uh, village, uh, Tarrytown um, uh, village manager Mike Blau is here. I've talked to Mike on the phone. He's going to talk to the mayor so we can set up a meeting and meet with him, the deputy mayor, and the town board. So this is going to be an ongoing process. Our plan uh, is to do as many meetings as people want to meet and talk and raise their uh, concerns. So we understand them and hear them, and uh, we're hoping, you know, you know, our plan now is to do 50 to 100 over the next two months. If we need to do 150, 130, whatever it's going to take to keep the community informed and to keep the dialogue open and the communication flowing, uh, we're here to do that in person, by phone, or whatever it takes. Thank you, and I also want to thank you 
for your commitment not to take a shortcut on all of the environmental issues. Thank you so much, Larry, Thanks. and all of you. Thank you. And just to uh, accentuate Larry's point, my job, my entire job, my charge from the governor is to gather as much information as I can from these experts and present it to you folks. That is what I'm going to do. So my door will always be open. Uh, once I get that BlackBerry, everybody will have the phone number, and I am going to be going from community to community and presenting the information, listening to the concerns. If I don't have the answers, I know exactly who to get the answers from, and I will bring the answers to you. That is my entire job. So uh, if you have any questions, as elected officials, for, for your constituents, come to me. If As residents, uh, as community activists, if you have questions, please come to me. And, and if you have a question before my phone number is published, call the 800 number, they'll give you my phone number. Uh, we also want to hear tonight from the chairman of the board of Westchester County Legislators, Mr. Ken Jenkins. Please come on up. First, good evening, and, and certainly thank you for the opportunity to, to address you all this evening. Um, this is an example of the perfect kind of opportunity to continue that level of communication that as Governor Cuomo has made a hallmark. So after 10 years of kind of a, a gridlock and roadblocks that have happened along the way, moving forward at this point in time, this is the perfect time not only to have 50 to 100 meetings. Um, I understand whatever community activist, whatever person will be able to have that open dialogue. Certainly we appreciate it as elected officials to be able to have that conversation with you as we make sure to uh, address the needs of the various residents in Westchester and Rockland County. But much more importantly, at this particular time, to continue to have that dialogue to make sure that we're not holding up progress on something that is absolutely necessary for the safety of the public, something that we have to do and something that we know is extremely expensive. We do not want to miss this opportunity on federal funds to make sure that we're doing this bridge work. We do not want to miss the opportunity to make sure that we're investing in our counties, both in Westchester and in Rockland and for the state of New York on the corridor. So I want to thank you. I know Mr. Schwartz for many, many years. I know when he says he means, he means exactly what he says, that you'll be able to contact him and the team assembled. Um, and certainly, certainly, we're looking forward to continuing that dialogue as we move forward through this particular process. And as it's been said, we know the impacts on the communities. I did drive across 287 this evening, just get in here, and we continue to see that construction. That delay cannot happen in this particular aspect. So again, we're looking forward to this, and the governor's leadership has been essential, working with the various levels of government to make it happen. So I want to thank you all for that, and we're looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your support, sir. Uh, Tim Idoni, the Westchester County Clerk, come on down, sir. Thank you. Congratulations, Brian. This means we don't have to be nice to you anymore. You're not <laughs> exactly. a reporter. Uh, Bring it on. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. La uh, Larry and, your, and your, uh, your team, thank you for being here this evening. Uh, just as a point of background in 15 seconds or less, I spent 32 years as a local government official, 11 years as a city and village manager, and, and 21 years now as an elected official. Um, and I was president of the Municipal Officials Association the year Larry talked about in terms of the expansion of 287. We saw the damages and the problems that can occur when there's an expansion of that road and they're not well thought out. And certainly the villages and towns need to be protected from Tarrytown right over to Port Chester. That having been said, uh, I also recognize, and I've been through hundreds of public works projects, dozens of environmental impact reviews, and, and one of the things that can slow this down to a crawl is excessive, excessive process, and I don't want to make that sound derogatory. Everybody has to have their, their say in this. We should have their say in it, but if it takes too long, as we found out from the 1999 statement from Governor Pataki, the project can fall apart from the weight of the time it takes to get it done. I'm a guy who cuts right to the chase, Larry, the team, uh, when can construction start? Uh, the goal is to start construction by the end of the year or the be very uh, beginning of 2013. There's still a lot of work to be done in between here and there. Getting the bids, uh, the final environmental impact statement, there's a lot of work to be done, but that is the goal by the end of this year or early next year. Uh, Mayor Mike Spano, City of Yonkers.
Brian, let me just say, uh, first off, welcome to the dark side. It's good to have You're you here. You're the fifth person who said that to me today, <laughs> oddly. For me, it's the bright side, Mayor. Yes, it is. Uh, with uh, over 130,000 cars that travel across this uh, bridge every single day, um, it's a bridge that was clearly not designed for that type of, for that type of action. And uh, for many years, I, I think of, you know, I got elected first when I elected the assembly in 1992, and there was talk then of when are we going to replace this bridge, how much is going to cost, and et cetera, and et cetera, and it went on and on and on. And you know what? We have to stop talking. We have to start building, and we have to get that bridge up and running. That bridge is critically important to the economic survival of this region, and we cannot afford to have that bridge uh, fail us at any time. So I want to thank our governor because it's been uh, this governor who has showed the leadership that has been needed to actually push this project forward. This is one of the, I think, one of the first times that we're actually experiencing real conversation about this bridge. And let's face it, um, in today's economic times, and I represent the fourth largest city in the state of New York, uh, we need jobs. And this, this, this um, is going to provide thousands of jobs, certainly to the people in our region. Uh, and that is going to be uh, welcoming news for, for many, many people. And uh, let me emphasize, I've always said there should be a mass transit um, component to this. There will be, uh, and I know that that's, uh, that's important, but let's make sure that whatever we do, we don't sock it to the taxpayers. They're already overburdened. And uh, so whatever, it ha whatever we put in place has to be something that's affordable. And so again, let me thank the governor. Uh, and I think this special panel is put together and uh, let you know that uh, I'm ready to put my hat on by and go to work. So just uh, let, let us know when. Thank you. Thank you for your support, sir. We appreciate it. Uh, Mayor Tom Roach, City of White Plains, you have a comment, sir, or a question. Thank you, Brian, and uh, congratulations. And now you get to answer questions instead of asking them. It's a little weird uh, for me. Yeah, it's a harder <laughs> side, I'll tell you that. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, as the mayor of White Plains, 287 is the lifeblood of the county. It's the only road that actually crosses the county. The, the misnamed Cross County you know, is Yonkers to Mount Vernon. Uh, so it is an essential roadway. And when I talk to other mayors about their waterfronts, they always tell me they envy my 287 front. <laughs> Having said that, it is a very, uh, overloaded highway, and I agree with, uh, with Mr. Roach's comment that you cannot build your way out of that. I think Long Island is kind of a laboratory for that. It's pretty much paved, and there's still traffic jams. Um, so having said that, um, Governor Cuomo has been very supportive uh, across the state uh, with regard to public transit issues. Um, and I know we've touched on it, several people have touched on transit ready, but could you just, um, that's the biggest question I get from my constituents is what does that mean? So could someone give me that in a, in a box that I can share with uh, my, my, my residents? Transit ready, anybody? Karen Ray? Um, I think simply put, um, the way the bids went out and the way the environmental document, it means that the width exists on the surfaces of the bridge, on the decks, and it means that it's structurally sound to support future commuter rail builds. So we've spent a lot of time developing the criteria that are not only in the environmental document, but are also in the proposal documents, asking for these criteria to be met, which is how we can say it's transit ready for the future. Of course, that does include on top of it, using dedicated lane for express bus service that we will be analyzing and finishing the final alignments on as we move forward in this project so that it can be up and running, especially during peak hours, right when the bridge opens. Well, that is all the questions we have on the cards I was provided. If any of you, Andre Stewart Cousins, you want to say something? You're not on my card, <laughs> but go ahead. Yes, well, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. And uh, because I represent not only uh, the Senate, but, but uh, Tarrytown, uh, I think it's extremely uh, essential that not only you hear from the Assembly, that you also hear from the Senate. Because in addition to the administration, as you can see, uh, the partnership is required. It, I think all of my colleagues have very eloquently stated why we know this is important. And I think that everyone has touched on 
uh, deliberately the concerns that were expressed. But certainly for those of us who represent constituents who were constantly uh, not only wanting our ear, but wanting answers, the fact that there is a presence, a serious presence, a presence that will be on site will, I think, go a long way to assuage the concerns and to continue with the tra transparency and openness that um, the governor has committed to. So again, because there are so many people speaking, I did not want to have my voice unheard and certainly uh, look forward to um, the jobs, the creation of the, the economic uh, environment that we so need as well as making sure that we are that transportation hub. I guess I do have one question, however. We had talked about the uh, governor's goals, and you said the governor's goals were ambitious. I don't know if people know what the governor's goals for DBE are in terms of percentages, so it would be good if you would tell us what that is. And I, I agree that, that they are good goals, but I don't think we, we know what they are, or everyone knows. Tom, you want to do that? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Senator, and thank you for your support. I've enjoyed uh, participating in briefings with you on this subject in the past. And, uh, and so to your question, uh, the, the overall goal for the project is 10%. And again, this was the objective was to set a realistic and attainable goal. And there, the goal is broken down into different components based on the capacity that was available of, of workers in those uh, categories of disadvantaged businesses, minority women-owned businesses. So there are certain aspects of the construction where the goals are as high as 17%, and then there's areas where there's just no capacity in, in the region or even close outside the region where the goal is below 10%. So the aggregate is 10%. And we had a, um, a forum for those categories of, of businesses uh, several months ago at the Doubletree, and we had a sellout crowd, and we had representation from, I think, 15 different states, but the Hudson Valley and all across New York State was very well represented, and there was a tremendous amount of interest in folks you know, coming in, partnering <coughs> up, and, and it was in, part of the objective of that, of that um, evening was to get uh, connected and to get these businesses acquainted with some of the teams that were participating in the, in the proposals, but also some of the, the smaller companies in the Hudson Valley that will likely be contributing to the project over the next five years. Thank Thanks, you. sir. Uh, Dave Padgett, at the end, I, I feel horrible because you haven't been addressed directly. Is there anything you'd like to add to the discussion? No, I, I think the points have been made. Thank you, sir. <laughs> That's, he, that's rare and uncharacteristic for a lawyer, but well received. He, he is an attorney, and I think the reason he was here is in case I said something wrong, he would have corrected me, but uh, I appreciate that. All right. Uh, Tom Abadanti, State Assemblyman, wants to say something. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the entire team for coming to Westchester and, and meeting and speaking with the people in the community. So often when there's a, a project uh, from a government that seems so far away, and you don't have real people to talk to and to touch, and I think this is very important, and we thank you for that. As you know, I represent the community that, that is the, the eastern landing point for the uh, Tappan Zee Bridge, and my communities have been very, very concerned, one about the construction and two about the final project. And I think you're showing that you have heard a lot of the concerns. Uh, you're, you're, you're moving forward on this issue of mass transit uh, is, a, is, a, is a good indication. Uh, those of us who have been involved in this for quite, un for quite some time understand the difficulty in trying to solve the entire transit problem of the corridor with the Tappan Zee Bridge. You just can't do that. But I think you have shown that you understand the problem and that we're going to work forward, we're going to work together, uh, perhaps simultaneously on a separate path to deal with that issue while we move forward on the Tappan Zee Bridge. And I look forward to working with you on some other issues that, that, are, are, that concern the community. What I'm looking for, as I said it, um, over and over again, is a community-friendly bridge. And I'm hopeful we can use this mechanism that you've set up to deal with a lot of the issues 
that deal with different parts along the Hudson River and along the corridor. So I thank you for coming. I thank you for setting up this task force, this, this working group, and I look forward to working with you and the other members of our community along the Hudson River. Thank you. All right, I'm being told we're out of time, but I do see Paul Gallet and, uh, and Ernie Davis. Go ahead, Mr. Gallet, Riverkeeper. Thank you. This is the only time I've ever had to raise a mic stand to speak, so thank you for that. <laughs> Kudos to you all for uh, taking the time to come tonight and the information you're providing, which is very helpful. But I'm going to challenge you to take it to another level. And I know you're up to the challenge. I know the governor is up to the challenge, and all the others up on the stage are as well. You have to understand that the information you're sharing this evening comes at the end of the bidding process. If you were to start the bidding process in two months and take some time to consult with us and then shape the bidding process around what you're hearing, then that would be a very different story. But you started the bidding process before you even received the public comment on the EIS. You're going to res respond to the public comment, the 3,000 comments you mentioned, after you open the bids. So you have to understand that that creates a certain degree of skepticism about whether we're going to go that next level, go from information to consultation to real change if change is appropriate. And so I'm here essentially to ask two questions. The first question is, are you ready to make real changes in this project if the comments that you get from us during this consultation period warrant it? And the second question is, let's get down and dirty on mass transit. You've said it costs $5 billion. You haven't got your funding plan in place for the $5 billion bridge that you want to build. When do you believe you'll have that other $5 billion so that we will be able to start constructing real mass transit on this corridor? Any takers? Larry Schwartz? Paul, nice to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, Look, we have to work on the first five billion before we start working on the second five billion. Uh, we have to do things smart. We have to do things in a responsible way. And we have to include everybody in the process in terms of the long-term uh, future, in terms of planning transit, not only for the 287 corridor, but for the whole region. And do it in a, a financially responsible way, an affordable way, and, and a, in a way that's not gonna have a negative impact on our communities here, their quality of life as well as the business community. So we're committed to um, put together a planning process to figure out what we can do. We're committed to getting cars off of 287. I grew up on Long Island. I've spent plenty of years on the Long Island Expressway as well as now 287 um, living out here in Westchester for like 14 years. So we get it, we understand it. The governor is a Westchester County resident. He's been stuck in traffic plenty of times. So we wanna get cars off the road. But we have to figure out what's the smart way, what's the practical way, what's the feasible way. We will look for federal funds as well as state dollars on how we can fund any future mass transit uh, initiative on a going forward basis. Um, and to your other question, look, we believe the process has been an open process. Uh, we're gonna make it more open going forward. There's been thousands of pages of documents. There's been 10 years of hearings, studies, meetings. So I think um, it's been pretty open, pretty transparent. Uh, there may not be agreement on everything, and we look forward to working with the Riverkeeper, the other environmental groups, to address any concerns that you may have. Uh, we have been very conscious about uh, mitigating uh, impacts on the river. We continue to dialogue with you on that, again, and, and do the very best we can uh, for the people of this state and for the counties of Westchester and Rockland. So was that a yes that meaningful change is still possible in the project? That, that's a yes. We're going to continue to have a dialogue and communicate and work with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Ernie Davis, and he's the last one. We're out of time. Okay, I have a series of questions. Uh, uh, what are you going to do with the existing bridge? You said it costs a lot to maintain. The, the uh, existing what, bridge, Mayor, will have to be removed once the new bridge is completed. How, how much would that cost to do that? I don't know the number off the top of my head. I'm happy to get, get back to you with the number. Okay. A um, hundred years is not a long time. Um, 
why is it designed just to last 100 years? Uh, if, I, if I come in on that one, um, what we're actually saying is that it should last 100 years before major maintenance is required. It will actually last a lot longer. That's the whole plan. I see. Um, what do you project to be the maintenance cost for the new bridge? Um, in the life of the bridge, it, w it will change. Um, on bridges that I've worked on around the world, the maintenance cost sometimes is 0.25% of the cost of the bridge, which might be one or two million dollars for the bridge beginning, off, beginning the first 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And it may grow over time as painting, as cleaning, uh, as things of that nature are required. But in, in the first 40 to 50 years, it'll be very low. And it'll just be a matter of keeping it clean. Um, when do you expect to uh, start the bridge and how long will it take to uh, construct the bridge? The goal is to begin construction by the end of 2012, beginning of 2013. And my understanding, it's a four-year, four to five, four to five year uh, construction project. Uh, last question, what would keep you from uh, realizing the schedule? I'm sorry, Mayor, I didn't hear what, what you. Would, what do you foresee would be uh, the problem in starting on the date that you project? I'm not anticipating any problem, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, we have a can-do governor, and, uh, I, and I'm here to work with the community uh, on behalf of the governor to keep to the schedule. As we said, the FEIS will come out the beginning of next week sometime or in the middle of next week. Uh, the bids come in. We'll continue to work with the community, but the governor has made it clear that uh, we've been studying this bridge for 11 years. Every year a delay drives up the cost approximately $250 million a year. That's not in the interest of our taxpayers. That's not in, in the interest of our community. We have an 8% unemployment rate. We need to use the jobs. We need to create the jobs. We need, we need this for the future economic vitality of the region, and we need to move forward, and that's our plan. Lastly, uh, has you anticipated uh, the use of a tunnel instead of a bridge? Uh, tunnel's a non-starter, Mayor. Doesn't work. It's way too expensive, and the impact on both the Rockland and Westchester side would be enormous for our local communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes this forum. If any of you did write down questions that we did not get to, you will get an answer. If you put contact information on that card, we will respond to you within 48 hours. Thank you all for being here. Many more of these meetings to come.